This is the Bible College of Wales continuing lecture channel. We welcome you to The Anointing. This is David P. Griffiths welcoming you once more to our lectures on the anointing. And let me tell you this, students of the Bible College of Wales continuing, what is vital to understand is that every part of the fivefold ministry must operate in the anointing. Academic intellectual thought is not what ministry is all about and if there's going to be one particular part of the ministry which is particularly important in relation to moving in the anointing then it is the role of the prophet the prophet is not one who gives social service advice brings the conditions for individuals to hear from God themselves, to move in power, might and dominion of the Spirit. And here we are today, in these last days, and the ministry of the prophet is coming to the fore. And later on, Lindsay is going to sing the midnight cry, singing about the prophecies which are now being fulfilled in these last days. What I would also say about the role of the prophets, it is a role of great rejection, of great suffering, of great moving in such power, but to bring those conditions it commonly gets brought to nothing and moves in trance like states moving in high places high above the natural realm and speaks in line completely with the spirit such was the old-fashioned preacher who indeed was really a prophecy I remember from the 1950s in our mission hall in Liverpool how these were days when a preacher would not be called a prophet but that's what he was because what was coming out was from the innermost heart it was God speaking and instead of the term sermon we would commonly use the term message of someone who's delivering the message but a prophet is not only someone who prophesies or preaches. A prophet is someone who has within him or herself a passion for justice. Nothing can stop them. They are fighters. They are courageous. They are full of God's glory. And so as we move in this power today and gain an understanding as you downloaded your notes, we praise the Lord that we have opportunity to identify the prophet's anointing in the name of Jesus. This is the Bible College of Wales lecture channel, also live streaming at ecctv.org. We welcome you today for our study number nine, the prophet's anointing. Now, when we come to moving in this power, might and dominion, as Lindsay fades down the music while I was doing like this, and, and she's going looking at me like this. Uh, <laughs> what we do is move in such a realm that the forces of darkness, you see, when we move in the higher realm, the forces of darkness have no place there. This is a place of absolute victory. 
Now, I have included in your notes, as you'll see on pages one, two, three, and moving on all the way, the first part of these notes, all the way to page 18. Prophecies that have come through my lips, my wife Lindsay will tell you, has been married nearly 30 years, uh, commonly waking up in the night and faithfully she gets up and writes down the words which the Lord has given. And some examples I have given of this in pages 1 through to 18 of your notes. And you'll see in there they ha very much have a wide perspective. They are dealing with issues of nations, issues of this world, speaking powerfully into situations. You see, when we come to this analysis, which you find on page 18 of a prophet, fundamentally the prophet fights for justice and righteousness, just as Elijah did. In days of old. And he was rejected for so long. He had to hide for so long. But he knew his day was going to come. And this has been like Lindsay and I in our locality here in North Wales. We've been so rejected. We've had a hostile group come against us. We've had all manner of evil spoken against us. Such <coughs> is the life of a prophet. And as we study this analysis before we come to question one, this concern for justice and righteousness is a very powerful one. It brings, as it says here, a prompting to speak on behalf of God and the expectations of his word. It engages in intercessory prayer, sensing strategy, for spiritual warfare, when Brian Mason and I go out on intercession trips, the Spirit usually leads me to the particulars of where these intercessions are to take place and to Brian as an intercessor in the general sense. And so teamwork comes. Because ministry is teamwork. You can't have a pastor in a congregation and that's it. It's not in the scriptures and it doesn't work. It just puts burden on one man. What you have is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers working together as a team. Not one better than the other. Because we, as you'll find out in this course many times, the fivefold ministry is not positions. The prophet's not a position. It's not an office as such. It's an activity. It's an overwhelming activity. Possesses an uncanny boldness and sensitivity for bringing correction to God's people corporately and personally. Is zealous when God's name is misrepresented by the church or other Christians. And often experiences Spiritual direction and promptings with information not humanly gained. That is a prophet. So our question one, what is the difference between a prophet and one who prophesies? Now, when we come to the biblical background in part two, studying part two will help you in the answer to part one. So I'm giving you major clues here. And as we come to the biblical background, 2 Timothy 1.11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle and teacher of the Gentiles. I see the preaching role as the prophetic role. <clears throat> Acts 13 sees Paul restoring the landmark, an operation of the office of prophets. So we know Paul as preacher, apostle, teacher, and now prophet. And this passage of scripture is a real key in understanding the role of the prophets and will help you in your answer to question one and question two. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And here Paul is telling the Corinthian church, 
It's not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And there is a massive price to pay for this. You see, those of you joining the Bible College of Wales continuing lecture course and written course by internet on the anointing, you need to understand if you're going to become a real minister of God, there is suffering involved and mostly in the role of a prophet. You know, the scripture says a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And so many ministers are in their own country. And so many ministers are rejected. And so what we're saying here that you need to move in this realm and we'll be dealing with the issue of trances in just a moment. For they are common to the prophets. You can't have an intellectually thinking prophet. Because the two go against each other. And here is Paul. He's not knowing where he's coming or going. You might say, well, Paul's in the prophet. Well, he also calls himself a preacher, and a preacher is a prophet. And you can move in and out of fivefold ministry activity. An apostle and prophet work together as one. That is the activities. For these activities are the foundations of the church. And so many ministries think they can operate with just the pastor and the people. It always fails. Because at, if when I say at the head, it does not mean that they are any better or worse than anybody else. Because we're all, if we're born again, joint heirs with Christ. But there is a activity here which gives protection over the other activities of the fivefold ministry. And Paul didn't know whether he was in the body, couldn't tell, out the body, couldn't tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. So Paul was used to moving in the higher place, as is the prophet. Then in verse 5, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory. There's no such thing as a proud prophet, only a broken one. There's no such thing as a proud apostle, only a broken one. For out of this comes a humility. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, says Paul. I will say the truth, but now I forbear, that any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. He was conscious that he was not wanting to be looked up to in his ministry role. He simply wanted to be the empty vessel for Christ. He said, I live, yet not I, but Christ. Galatians 2.20 And here Paul comes, and this is the big lesson, students. And needs to come out in your answers. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. For with the prophetic anointing comes that constant buffeting. It's there all the time. The more you reveal the revelations of God. The more the enemy is determined that what comes out of your lips doesn't get there. So was given to him a thorn in the flesh. Hallelujah. Yet there are Christians who come for healing lines asking for their thorn to be removed. What foolishness is this? Even Paul tried it. I sought the Lord thrice. <laughs> And the reply from the Lord, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities. 
that's not sickness, that's the Greek word asthenia, meaning mental inability. I'd rather glory in what I can't do than what I can do. So I take pleasure in this weakness, infirmities, as the scripture declares it. Reproaches, necessities, persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. He loved it. He took pleasure in it. And so when we turn over to page 20, we have question two. How is the prophet's role manifesting today? Now a good answer will get you 10 marks, both on question two and I think on question one, indeed. So give thought to these answers. I've given you a big hint here in relation to 2 Corinthians 12. Start seeking God and how you are to answer. Of course, higher marks will be given for prophetic revelation. Don't just hit me with simple facts. I want to hear the heart of God in your answers. Now we come to number three on page 21. The difference between the office of a prophet and the simple gift of prophecy. Now, it's a fact that every baptized in the Holy Ghost believer can prophesy. Because if you're immersed in the Holy Ghost, then your mouth does not belong to you. And God wants to use it to speak through. And that is whatever your calling is. When Paul said, I live, yet not I, but Christ. He was relating this to the normal life of the Christian who is an empty vessel through whom God can speak. And every baptized in the Holy Ghost believer can prophesy. And here we have it in 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one. Ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. Then in 1 Corinthians 14, 2-4, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. So there is a very crucial point that he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. And he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So the prophet, in his role as a prophet, and those who simply prophesy, because there is a distinction, bring understanding over what God is saying. But the distinction is that the prophet distinct from one who prophesies, brings direction, restores landmarks, and operates on a line that is only God-led. He does not bring direction in the natural mind. What he does is bring a stirring in the spirit that that is, that is being said. Bring spiritual sense rather than natural sense. And also the phenomena of healing miracles through the prophet can be to a huge degree. 
The prophets, even when he is preaching, can often be in a trance. And if you speak to him or her, they cannot really understand what you are saying if you are on the natural plane. Prophets are often in trances and therefore cannot be communicated with as really they walk on another sphere. You see, the prophet can be walking in this other sphere. And they have no clue what's going on around them. Prophets openly sees evil spirits and deals with them. And he also, or she, uses music to enhance the anointing. We do that on this channel. Luke 4, 1 to 37 is there before you. You can study this. Of how Jesus overcame Satan on the Mount of Temptation and declared prophecy that he was the fulfillment of prophecy. Refer or back to Isaiah 61. Then at the bottom of page 23, the story of Nehemiah. And then on page 24 of Elisha. And then the reference from Paul to the Corinthians, from 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. You know, this is by my spirit, saith the Lord. We have references of trances from the scripture, from Numbers 24.4. He has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance but having his eyes open. That's the common position of the prophet. And then from 24, 16 of Numbers, he has said which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. And then in the New Testament, from Acts 10.10, 10, he became very hungry, would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He wasn't with the natural proceedings that were going on. Then in 11.5 of Acts, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. And the final reference we have here is from Acts 22, 17. It came to pass that, I, that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even when I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And our final question, or rather our penultimate question, our penultimate question, what role do trances play in the life of a prophet? And then number four on page 26. The hand of the Lord, the anointing. How it comes on and how it goes off. We've had times in our fellowship here of the Holy Ghost coming out from us. In ministry times of having the Holy Ghost then come in from us. And so we're asking the question of getting into detail of how the anointing comes on and how it comes off. And we have references here to help you. From Ezekiel 8, 1 to 10. From Ezekiel 37, 1 to 10. From Ezekiel 40, 1 to 10. 
and Ezekiel 33 and 22. Our question being, go into detail of how the anointing comes on and how the anointing comes off. So to summarize what we've been saying today, I have given you examples at the beginning of your downloaded notes of prophecies which have been given through me over the years to give example of how prophecy is given today, of how a prophet fights for justice, how a prophet moves in the heavenly plane, how a prophet is not afraid to go in a trance. A prophet also is not afraid or battles with it. When he's taken through shadows of the valley of death and fears no evil is a sign of the natural realm having been defeated in the mind of a prophet. For the attack on the prophet can be so vast, so enormous, and so massive that what we are saying here as we look at these questions, we are saying simply, don't think you can get the right answers from the natural mind. But what I'm looking for is example of revelation, example of understanding of the scriptures, taking these questions to the high places of God, these questions being very detailed if you're going to get your 10 marks. You know, as we consider the song Lindsay's about to sing, we understand that these are the last days. And as we move in these last days, the prophet is going to be there fighting for justice, exposing the corruption. At the time of this recording, it is just before the UK referendum on whether or not to be in the European Union. Our nation, having constitutional acts and relationship with the Commonwealth, which is of God, but the EU is a different source. So the prophets are crying out in the heavenly realm for Britain to reject a European Union based on the idols of Baal, rather than a coronation oath, which calls for the Holy Ghost to come from above and give that unction from above and give the monarch of the, the land the words to speak as an empty vessel. All this has been taken away from Britain and the prophet is crying out for his nation. Likewise, where you live, in the circumstances you are, if there is any corruption, the prophet will cry out unto the Lord. And it may be times that that prophet has to run for shelter, just as Elijah did. But Elijah rose tall. And whatever the result of the UK referendum, the prophet has spoken that that which is not of God will fall. And the prophet knows, using biblical example, that it is only the wise man who built his house on the rock. For over the centuries, kingdom after kingdom has fallen. And I prophesy the EU will fall, not only in Britain, but through the whole of Europe. Because every kingdom has fallen except for one. And it is this kingdom which the prophet proclaims. And as Lindsay comes up to sing this wonderful song, the midnight cry, consider these things being revelation unto God 
as you write down your answers. For this is no academic course, I can tell you. For this course is on the anointing. And these are the last days. As Lindsay comes up now and takes my microphone and sings the midnight cry. The second verse being, I see prophecies fulfilling and signs of the times appearing everywhere. We give Jesus the praise and all the glory. This has been the prophet's anointing. We thank you for joining us for part nine of the anointing course. Join us for part 10, which deals with the apostolic call. Lindsay, sing this with all of your heart. Amen. Thank you, David. This is the song, The Midnight Cry, which is all about the end times and the fulfillment of prophecy. Rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds a call. Oh,
Thank you for joining us for the anointing course. You too can be a student of the Bible College of Wales continuing. Contact us at PO Box 106, Carwin Bay, Wales, LL284XJ. You can phone us. If you're in the UK, it's 01492 54451 or fax us at 01492 545964. And our special email address for Bible College students, phcc4219 at aol.com. phcc4219 at aol.com. You can see our television channel at ecctv.org. Website details are coming up, and we welcome you. Our fees, well, the price has been paid by the Lord. We simply need your heart to study God's Word and receive God's Word here at the Bible College Wales.